this rather contentious argument, I think that sexual violence is clearly one phenomenon that presents itself as translatable across contexts, thus inviting the singular and universal response, which is now becoming familiar. Um, as feminists ourselves, that is myself and my colleague Vitya, as proponents of a critical modern political language, we have been taken aback in the last few years by how the task of social transformation in popular discourse is being assigned to the forces of globalization. Uh, the key targets of such transformation are young urban women, and as such they are also attracting the anger of right-wing groups who present themselves as the custodians of Indian culture. So we framed our research project to inquire into the factors that place young women in the city at risk in relation to the effects of globalization. Um, does the discourse of globality interpolate all women in the same way across class, caste, and religion? Does the space of the city, which is supposed to underplay these distinctions, stimulate this process of flattening desire in the name of new opportunities? What's the promise of the 21st century Indian city for the recent migrant? And how is it played out or realized across class caste? How does a young woman whose family is from the city relate differently to it? These are some of the questions we put to the framing of our interviews. These were done over a long period. These were done with, with each interview was like an hour or two hours. Uh, they were very informal. We were just trying to, you know, they were in different languages. They were in English, they were in Canada, they were in Tamil and some in Hindi, uh, depending on who we were talking to and often in a mix of these languages. So the translation difficulties were quite immense. Um, why are we looking at Bangalore? I think I've already mentioned some of the reasons. But uh, I think that we are interested in the different ways in which Bangalore women are prominent features in the urban landscape. One, you have the high employment of women in two key sectors of globalization. In the IT sector, we have nearly 400,000 women out of a total of 900,000 in IT. In the garment industries, also close to 400,000 since 1991, and the consequent concerns that emerge around these practices. So as I said, the visibility of working women in Bangalore is very striking, although there are only 20% of the available females. Uh, the liminal location of Bangalore is another reason for our attention. It's neither a metropolis nor a small town, although some people may call it a metro in waiting. Uh, but it draws in migrants from outskirts and from afar. It's urbanizing process enmeshed in the vast networks of globalization. Uh, a third reason was the long history of women's activism in Bangalore uh, since the 1970s, whether in the form of autonomous women's groups or NGOs, that has ensured the prominence of women's issues in the public sphere. Uh, there are also forms of activism in the last few years around young women and culture, such as the Pink Chaddi internet campaign after the, an attack on a pub in Bangalore in 2009, and the Fearless Karnataka campaign, which started after the 2009 attacks on half a dozen young women in Bangalore, ostensibly for speaking English, wearing Western clothes, and smoking on the street. These were the uh, comments made by uh, the people who attacked them. So I've already told you we spoke to young women across a range of sectors. We also spoke to three people who identified themselves as transgender, and one person who identified as intergender or gender queer. These latter conversations in particular helped us to denaturalize the common sense of gender difference and gender relations and made us question some of our assumptions about the gendering of childhood, family, urban life, education, and work. We retain the term woman as a gender description, though, both because of the feminist histories it belongs to, and because in this project, difference emerges strongly and in a created fashion, not just as gender difference, through the narratives and articulations of our interlocutors who are speaking from varied locations. Mm -hmm. um, I will see, depending again on time, so I can speak till about three. Yeah. Okay. I think I'll be able to get through this. So I want to look at girlhood, I want to look at marriage, I want to look at work, followed by a discussion on self-identification, and finally a section on um, how our research challenges the public-private binary currently so prevalent in discussions about women. Although culture is not always named as such in all our conversations, the culture was framed through issues of caste, community, gender identity, sexuality, risk, consent, and agency are never far from the surface. And the significance for thinking about gender cannot be overlooked. So becoming woman is the name of this section. What does it mean to become a woman at this historical juncture in the Indian city? Um, we spoke to young women who had grown up in the 80s and 90s to see how they understood their own histories of gendering. 
earlier women's movement and government studies, such as the landmark 1974 Towards Equality Report. The Towards Equality Report was more looking at rural women. There has been uh, a you know, subsequent report only 40 years later, and it's still not public. So we don't have access to that uh, information. And I think it does have sections on urban women. Otherwise, there's not that much available uh, in terms of uh, policy documents on that. So earlier women's movement and government studies focused on um, documenting women's education, child labor, child marriage, malnutrition of the girl child, uh, trafficking, sun preference, etc. Right? Uh, that phenomena that produce quantifiable evidence for discrimination against women. But in the way these phenomena are picked out for study, they do tend to displace the girl child as the subject of the experience of gendering. And that's the nature of that discourse. We have no problem with that. But we are saying that through the kind of in-depth interviews that we conducted, we can reconstruct the experience of growing up through the memory of the adult interviewee and hope then to contribute to the recentering of her experience as a way of understanding and dealing with how the processes of differentiation and discrimination work. Our family is still the central site at which gendering occurs. Does gender preference still operate in the same way within families? How do young women today remember growing up as girls? How have they experienced their gendering in an age in which the status of the girl child is a governmental marker of the country's development and a signifier of its readiness for globalization? So often the first response of those uh, young girls we talked to about their experience of growing up as a girl was to refer to the idea of discrimination. We didn't even mention the term, they just brought it up, right? Even in a, in a, a negative way. Clearly indicative of the fact that the discourse of gender difference is central to the prevailing understanding of what it means to be female in India. As Deepthi, an IT employee, said, I quote, compared to anyone else, I had a very good childhood. No problems with girl child education. You know, there's a phrase that is available to be even countered. Surya, an 18-year-old student doing her BA, says, I didn't face the problems that many women faced growing up. In my case, gender hasn't been an issue. When we asked about how she dressed while going out, or whether she thought about safety in public spaces, she said, these things just happened. No one ever came to me and told me this is what you have to do. Automatically, I started being careful about wearing really short dresses. It's not about morals. You just generally learn that it's not safe to wear this and that. Mm -hmm. that. She did not hear this from her parents, but generally learned it. Um, in Surya's liberal childhood, there's no heightened consciousness of gender difference and no memory of an authority that shaped her practices as a girl and a young woman. She appears to distinguish a personal understanding of herself as a woman from a social understanding of what women experience. So we are compared to ask, what is it about the moment of history that we're living in that allows a young woman of a particular class to grow up without a heightened alertness to her gender, uh, up to a certain point? But does the transition from school to college or to university change the girl's awareness of and engagement with public space? How does the nature of gendering change as a result of this engagement? Oh, you know what? I forgot all about this power. Maybe you just need to take a quick look at a couple of things. It has more to do with the, my first points about, um, does this not work, the down arrow? Yeah. This is just a picture from uh, the protests against Delhi rape case in 2012. I'll be mentioning that later on, so you can just take a look. This is, uh, uh, you know, uh, Durga Vahini, which would be mm -hmm. a right-wing women's group, mm -hmm. also protesting against the same issue. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about the unanimity of response across the political spectrum. Uh, this is a project called Blank Noise that some of you who work on India may be familiar with. It actually originated in Bangalore, at a student in an institution where we used to teach, uh, where the woman uh, assembles uh, assembled this project based on the clothes someone wore when they were being molested or raped. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, you know, a major concern. It's a very famous project. This is the Fearless Karnataka campaign that I mentioned. And this is now someone trying to make money by selling pepper spray. <laughs> okay. <coughs> I have a couple more things I'll show you later. Um, a key aspect of consciousness of gender had to do with caste position, as we found in our interviews. Uh, this wasn't always explicitly discussed. Although some, like Ramaka, an activist and NGO employee, did foreground this aspect. Speaking about puberty, she says, I quote, In my community, we don't have a system of segregating women who have menses. When I first got it, my mother cried, and there's a puja. 
But apart from that one time, there was no separate eating, no separate vessels, nothing. And my house didn't even have a puja room, just three pictures. There were no such restrictions like that in our houses. But now with development, more of our people are imitating upper caste. We used to be free. Unlike in dominant caste households, menstruation is not imagined here as polluting. So the growing girl is not confined to a separate space during her period. However, uh, this same person, Ramaka, was very aware of growing up as a Dalit girl. I quote, when you're small, your experience of caste is different as a girl. Second, my name, Ramaka, is different and odd, and then my dark color. These three things have always made me vulnerable, and people took it for granted that they could abuse me. Her father loved girl children, and her brother was the one who brought the beatings. Her being a girl did nothing to hinder her education. She was sent to a private school, and her father made every effort to ensure that she did well and moved on to college. Although Ramaka went to a private school, being the only Dalit in her class meant that she was constantly humiliated by the other children who didn't want to sit next to her or play with her. Being a brilliant student eased her path somewhat. Um, she was the first girl in her family to complete her 12th grade and the first person in her family to get a college degree. Thus, it was not her family but her caste position that made life as a girl difficult for her. All her narratives of discrimination, she names that experience as in Kannada, Bhayankara of Mana, a fierce and terrible humiliation. So all her narratives of discrimination feature the world outside the family. Upper caste neighbors who wouldn't let her watch TV from an open window and beat and pushed her when she continued to watch. Schoolmates who made fun of her for eating ragi mudde. Uh, temples that didn't allow her entry. So her memories of being a girl are tied to this distinction between her family life and life in the outside world. Uh, one more example, uh, this is Nutan, a trans woman who spoke to us about her struggle to define and defend her identity. And she mentioned the disconnect between feeling like a woman and what she was made to perform in public, which is to force to wear men's clothing and behave like a man. I was not able to maintain myself, she says. This inability forced her to leave her childhood home, where her parents had accepted her desire to change her gender, and inhabit the difficult public world as a hijra in Bangalore, the constant subject of persecution by the police. Newton's acts of migration, change of clothing, negotiation with classmates, and her family relationships bring to light the techniques and daily negotiations involved in the process of gendering. The standard narrative of women who grew up, who grew up shackled by the norms of girlhood into which they're socialized, and the employment of this linear narrative to explain gender discrimination and violence against women are disturbed considerably by these accounts of trans people's experience. I fear that I have skipped the section on marriage, but I will save it. If any of you have questions about marriage, I can use some of this because I don't think there will be time otherwise. There's a, we have a short section on marriage. The report is over 200 pages long, but since the ICSR still hasn't approved it, we are not publishing that as yet. So this is only a 25-page paper. Um, work. Let me come to work because I think it also gives us an opportunity to talk about interesting distinctions here. Bangalore's main industry before the 1950s was textile production. But after independence in 1947, the city housed several large public sector industries and their ancillaries, employing more than 110,000 workers in the, in the 60s and more than 300,000 by the 1980s. Today, as some of you would know, the public sector units are being dismantled. From the 1990s, coinciding with economic reforms, Bangalore became home to a still growing information technology industry. Although the textile mills are now gone, with only a few power looms remaining in the cheek-paid, cotton-paid area, the ready-made garment industry has emerged as the biggest employer of female labor. Typically between 18 to 25 years old, Karnataka's women garment workers are minimally skilled and belong to socioeconomically disadvantaged families in villages and small towns. They share overcrowded accommodation in Bangalore or, or stay with families. They stitch while standing or sitting upright for around nine hours a day with poor lighting and ventilation minimal breaks for using the bathroom and meals, and have respiratory ailments, back ailments, and all other kinds of uh, issues. I'm quoting here from uh, an NGO report. They sew nearly 150 pieces an hour, and uh, they have to work overtime without getting overtime paid because it's task-based, and they have to finish that, if they're pregnant or unwell. Uh, let me just show you from my collaborator, who I've collaborated with on two different films, but not on this one, uh, a very interesting uh, it's available online, so you can check for yourself. But I'll just show you the first two minutes. 
So I'm just going to talk about two of our interviews, which locate women's labor in the space of the garment factory and the space of the call center. We juxtapose these two spaces in relation to how they're experienced by the women who occupy them, pointing out the strong similarities that are covered over by different vocabulary. Uh, Indus has studied departs from the preoccupations of recent ethnographies of middle class working women. Uh, while these contribute to the understanding of women's labor in the 21st century, their focus often doesn't take into account the trajectories of different kinds of female labor that coexist along with white collar work under globalization, or the parallel nature of working conditions. The invisibility of non-middle class female labor in conditions of globalization skews the argument in accordance with the flattening of desire that we mentioned earlier. For example, the idea that Indian women use their globalized work context to obtain release, to get unbound, I'm quoting here from uh, a study by Rina Patel, from the moral and cultural ties, to so get unbound from the moral and cultural ties that hold them down, uh, is central to uh, a book like Rina Patel's Working the Night Shift. While the book touches upon the differences between call center workers and other female laborers, it quickly moves on to speak exclusively about the former, ignoring the possible similarities between the two. So placed side by side, our two interviews bring out the stark differences between the positions of the garment factory worker and the IT worker under globalization. While the factory worker, Priya, discusses sexual harassment and the dangers of night travel as aspects of factory work that the industry disregards, Sheila the techie insists that the night shift is not inherently dangerous for the call center worker and the responsibility is largely the employees to ensure that she stays alert while commuting and takes all the steps necessary to ensure her safety. The factory worker, although in the new globalized economy, demands that her employer and the state provide the necessary safeguards. The techie believes the individual worker should take care of herself, albeit within the ambit of the facilities provided by the employer. Sheila uses the phrase work culture to describe her office environment, which is the, the techie, right? Whereas Priya never refers to the garment factory as possessing a work culture. While both women bring up the idea of culture, they place it in very different contexts. For Priya, culture is something related to the worker's family which assigns her a role as wife and mother. Even if she wanted to work a night shift, the husband and mother-in-law would raise objections. Sheila, on the other hand, doesn't refer to culture in relation to the family at all, but only in the context of the workplace. For her, the BPO itself and the conditions of work in it produce a culture that shapes people's lives, I quote. Your work culture, your surroundings make you do things. It seems to be otherwise in the garment factory. Priya, who is also a union worker, talks about how in the union they know the workers' culture in the factory because of having worked there themselves, and this is how they gain their confidence. Workers' culture refers to what the garment workers bring with them into the workplace, whereas work culture in the IT sector is created by the conditions of work. The question of time also features a strangely mirrored form in the two narratives. Priya mentions how the women who stay back to meet their production targets are not paid over time, while Sheila speaks of the flexibility of timings and how only deliverables matter, not the hours that you put in. Notice the uncanny closeness of these two terms. Production targets for the garment workers, deliverables for the call center. At the same time, the distance from each other in how they are described. One, as a forced requirement of time spent in the factory, and the other in terms of choice, flexibility, and freedom from the constraints of time. For Sheila, the tyranny of time exists only in hardcore BPO call center work, in relation to which she does describe to us the time given for breaks and how she cannot leave her desk for even a few minutes outside of these. The terms culture and work culture also feature in what the interviewees say about sexuality. While factory workers are seen as either sexually oppressed or acting according to the characteristics of the social strata they belong to, uh, which involve lack of education or a rural origin, and the phrase that Priya used was, they'll come straight from the fields into the factory. Uh, so they just they behave like people from that strata when they engage in sex for favors. Uh, on call center workers, on the other hand, are seen as having left behind the social circumstances they belong to and exposed to a world of freedom and opposite sex relationships. Because of their low level of knowledge about sexual health, they do engage in risky behavior. Uh, many ITS companies now include HIV testing and counseling at the hiring stage as their response to the public perception that the call center is a high risk space. Garment workers, on the other hand, lead lives that are not part of the field of visibility of globalized work that includes the techie, and thus there are no workplace practices that pay attention to their sexual health. So while the techie has a work culture, a lifestyle, and a personality extending into the life of the city, the garment worker is usually a number to be counted in productivity projections. Uh, the garment worker is invisible, for example, 
um, in all the anxious discussions about public safety for women that have taken place in Bangalore in the last few years. Uh, the figures of our two women reveal a specific set of enmeshings of culture and economy at the present moment. Both workplaces come into being through the transactions between the transnational and the national. The call center worker seems to embody this transaction with the transnational, and is seen therefore as simultaneously Indian yet foreign, while the factory worker is part of the underbelly of globalization, that part of the transnational transaction that is never seen unless there's a kind of disaster like the one that happened in Bangladesh in 2013, killing over a thousand people. The enormous amount of public attention paid to the privatized world of the call center and to the private lives and acts of its employees, their sex lives, their marriages, their consumption practices and leisure activities, all of this contributes to the generation of a private sphere that becomes a public concern. With the factory worker, however, we see a public interest situated almost entirely within the framework of labor laws and referring mostly to work conditions within the factory. Any kind of cultural concern for the factory worker is either relegated to the realm of the private, where it's dealt with by family, or the realm of the state, where it is dealt with through legal governmental measures. The frenzy around the techie, on the other hand, cannot be relegated to the domain of the state, and thus has to be staged over and over again as part of the cultural conditions of our contemporary. Um, Self-identification, okay, I think I can manage these two sections. Um, does globalization change the routes by which young women engage in processes of self-identification. Our focus was on the intersections of gender, sexuality, caste, and religion. Uh, and in our study, class is strongly correlated with caste, so we don't, don't look at that separately. Earlier work from the 1990s has pointed out the ways in which gender, understood as pertaining to women, had become absorbed into the vocabulary of Indian modernity, while caste and religious identity have been relegated to the sphere of the non-modern, the realm of tradition, representing obstacles to the modernization of the nation. Today, under 21st century globalization, gender as well as sexuality and sexual violence, as we have pointed out, have become global terms through the same process that localizes caste and religion. Needless to say, the latter have been at the heart of severe conflicts in the public domain over the many decades since independence in 1947 and continue to feature prominently in recast ways in the early 21st century. Progressive institutions like the National Law School in Bangalore, where we interviewed a number of students, have institutional policies that enshrine gender equality and sensitivity to LGBTQ issues, but disavow caste, class, religion, even as discussion topics. As one law student, Ratna, told us, I quote, why is talking about LGBT rights much easier than talking about caste? Is because the way the Dalit movement or anti-caste movement is structured, you have to call out your upper caste background. You can't talk about it without acknowledging that. Whereas if you're talking about LGBT rights, no one is going to say, why, uh, why are you heterosexual? So it's really much easier. Here she was referring to the obligatory acknowledgement of privilege, background, and economic status of the speaker in discussions of caste and religion in India. The claims that are being made in the name of minority caste and religions are being made vis-a-vis -vis this privilege. So and while being a man or being a heterosexual is naturalized as a biological aspect of the self, caste and religion are read as purely social aspects of the same self, and hence treated as potentially divisive. We see a distinction operating between caste and religion as systems in operation outside the institution and as systems informing daily practices within that institution. That is, what can be easily spoken about as discrimination in the outside world creates discomfort when brought too close to home, whether in relation to the institution or to the students. So these issues tend to get suppressed even in enlightened space like the law school. Um, I'm going to skip some of this here how the workplace deals with diversity. So the IT companies have celebrations for Diwali, Ramzan, and Christmas. They get memos about gender and sexual orientation. They undergo sensitization programs. Uh, and curiously, language and region seem to be coming to the fore in terms of workplace identities and promotion, recruitment, et cetera. But you know, we won't go into that here. Those interviewees in our project who are themselves lower caste were obviously more sensitive to everyday practices of caste discrimination and how they were changing and globalizing Bangalore. In the early 90s, the person I, we talked about before, uh, Ramaka, the area where she lived began to change due to development. Uh, this her term in English. And she identifies a practice she calls modern untouchability, which took shape while she was growing up. What I mean by that is, uh, what I mean by modern untouchability, she says, is that we have such a sense of inferiority uh, that our body behaves in a certain way when they come near. 
they may be upper caste people. We bend slightly. We make space for them and put them first as if they're something great. Our people might be speaking on the phone, holding a more expensive phone than the upper caste people, but when one of them comes near, without our knowledge, our body language changes and we surrender. These practices are not visible to our eyes, but they happen. Body language is filled with untouchability. It doesn't appear like direct casteism when you look at it. In public, uh, certain practices and rituals like fetching water, when I was in 8th or 9th grade, in my area they installed a syntax tank with sweet water. And even upper caste people had to come there to fetch water. They couldn't tell us not to draw water from our own neighborhood, she says, because we could throw them out. So what they did is something that was not visible as untouchability. They did purification rituals. Whether with the temple or with the water tank, when we left the precinct, they purified that place. The more and more our lives changed, the more rituals and practices they came up with. When I go to their house, they bring out a chair, and they will also sit outside, so you can't call it discrimination. When they give me coffee or tea, they give it to me in a plastic glass, and they also drink from a plastic glass. Nothing is given in a proper glass. Isn't this untouchability? How clever they are, how criminal. For those people who don't observe this and are not sensitive, uh, they'll say, okay, they gave us a chair and tea, come, let's, let's go and visit them. Uh, but interesting thing is that we are more economically well off and educated, and we are helping them out. So they can't object, and they're obliged to me. I sometimes find happiness in giving them the trouble of cringing inside. But this is plastic globalization, she says. So instead of caste practices fading away under globalization, the processes of globalization are precisely those through which caste prejudice changes form and becomes plastic. Uh, denial of temple entry turns into the purification of temple premises. Bodily untouchability turns into changes in body language. Separate utensils for different castes becomes plastic disposable glasses for all castes. To those not at the receiving end of everyday casteism, these changes in casteist practice are barely noticeable. The municipal workers we interviewed, the ones who uh, clean the streets every day, uh, they also referred to the material practices of caste and how they played out differently in the city as opposed to their villages. I'll just read a short quote. Uh, caste is there whether it's in Bangalore or in our native places. The only difference is that when you're earning in Bangalore, you're earning more than them. That's a higher caste in the villages. So there's definitely that respect that when we go back to our native place, they will talk to us properly and ask, how are you? Not that they will invite us to come sit in their house. In our village, caste is inside their minds. In Bangalore also, if we ask for water at some houses, some give us in a plastic bottle. Some of them ask us to drink out of our hands, but we don't drink that. We say, we are humans like you. We also need to eat like you. Give it to us in a tumbler and then we fight with them and walk away. Although caste is not mentioned explicitly in this whole discussion, not giving them a glass and asking them to drink the water out of their hands is definitely a practice that labels the municipal workers as polluters. The women, of course, recognize it as a caste-based practice, since they've experienced the same in their villages. But just as Ramaka points out the shifts in power that have taken place, with the Dalits in their area being better off and more educated than the others, the municipal workers point to a similar shift, but vis-a-vis -vis the villages. In the city, they struggle to make minimum wage and feed their families, but when they return home, the same money helps ease some of the casteism, since they now have city incomes. For all kinds of reasons, the complexity of the changes in caste practices under globalization and the effects it produces in daily lives, uh, especially those of women, has not been well researched so far and future work is likely to produce even more startling results than our preliminary explorations. I come now to the, the last section of the paper, which is about public and private, and how these categories uh, could be complicated if you pay attention to what women are saying. Since even before the 2012 Delhi rape case, international coverage of incidents concerning women in India began to increase exponentially. Public dis discussions online and participation in offline campaigns around issues of violence against women is at unprecedented levels. Public sexual violence, in other words, has eclipsed all other gender concerns, really. Dowry, female feticide, domestic violence, child marriage, forced marriage, legal equality, equal access to schooling, employment, political participation, all of this are subsumed under public sexual violence in terms of policy making, urgent legislation, and police action. There is a long history of legal intervention in India relating to crimes against women. Rape, sexual harassment, domestic violence, acid attacks, stalking, are all seen as specific forms of sexual violence that target mostly women. And the aftermath of the Delhi rape 
witnessed a further entrenchment of questions of violence in the domain of the law. Because of the significant place occupied by the Delhi rape in the public imagination, and the national, almost global scale of the discussions that followed it, we were interested in finding out what the event meant for the women we were interviewing. Did it change the way they understood sexual violence? Did it alter the way they behaved in public space? The way they related to men, or the way men related to them? Did they participate in the protests? Was this for them the originary moment of an entry into political activism? Um, because the intense mediatization of the event made possible by the presence of 24-7 news channels in more than 20 Indian languages, and the elaborate detailing of the violence that one found on television, middle-class interviewees, especially college students, told us how they were deeply affected by the incident. Personalized stories about the victim and her family and eyewitness accounts created an unprecedented level of identification with her. The students were disappointed that once the media attention passed, the issue was lost sight of. Although the rape was seen as a national concern, they felt it did not change the way in which women are talked about by members of parliament or even the police. The 18-year-old women we spoke to in particular, as well as older interviewees, say they did not change their behavior in public as a consequence of this case. While they didn't see the rape as an isolated incident, they did not feel any more afraid on the streets. They experienced the aftermath of the Delhi rape as a time of intense emotion and disturbance, not necessarily an awakening to the phenomenon of rape. Among our activist interviews, there was a strong perception that the Delhi rape changed the language in which rape was described, that the protests definitely foregrounded a concern with victim blaming. They also felt that patriarchy doesn't manifest itself only in acts like rape, since the violence is not a random act or seen only in extreme incidents. They did point out as related to the gender division of labor within the family and the ways in which children grow up with specific ideas about how women can be treated, economic conditions that compel women to stay on in abusive situations, both domestic and in employment. And they did say that a lot of research isn't done because the data is not easy to produce. Uh, the movement against sexual violence, they felt, must address issues of caste, class, and religion with a critique of patriarchy extending into a critique of the developmental discourse uh, of neoliberalism and late capitalism, militarization, the discourse of security, the caste system, etc. Nutan from the Karnataka Sex Workers Union, there's a transgender person, raised the question of the kinds of women who can be imagined as victims of sexual violence. She called them official women, those whose experiences actually register in the public domain and are shown on television. Police often refused to file a sexual violence case brought by a female or transgender sex worker, saying they had no right to complain. Mm -hmm. Sex workers, even other than transgender ones, are among those whose concerns are not foregrounded in discussions about sexual violence. But in Bangalore, at least, there seems to be a some change in the way they're actually able to handle violence. One of our interviewees said, uh, she's a sex worker herself, I quote, sex workers at least have the courage if something happens to go and complain in the police station, or go to go to a women's organization and seek help. House women, it's a term that she used, house women don't have this courage. They're scared of the men in their homes and what will happen to their families. They get raped in their own houses, but they can't even complain. There's a lot of freedom to complain against sexual harassment, and we enjoy this freedom because we have come through this whole process. Um, according to her, the process of negotiating with the police or fighting each case of arrest and abuse has given them the confidence to file complaints against harassment and expect action to be taken. She argues that in contrast, house women, as opposed to street women, still live in fear of the stigma attached to sexual assault and rape. Issues of family honor and public shame keep them trapped in domestic situations which are violent and lack dignity, and marital rape in particular continues to be ignored and kept private. Uh, Nalini Jamila, in her autobiography of a sex worker, um, also offers an alternative standpoint from which to view sexual violence. At the launch of her book in Bangalore in March 2009, she's not from Bangalore, but she was launching her book there, Jamila reacted to the mainstream feminist response to sexual harassment, saying that outrage is not the only way of handling something that happens to you on the road. She talked about the sex worker for whom mere sexualization by men is not an exceptional circumstance to find themselves in. So they cannot feel that outrage at being sexualized. Instead, they negotiate situations through humor by saying things like, as if you could ever afford me, questioning the man's ability instead of only feeling shame or rage. The debate on safety, which has been prominent in feminist discussions in India and elsewhere, comes out of the concern with sexual violence. And we wondered what private public would look like mapped onto the safety axis. The Delhi rape led to a national outcry about public spaces needing to be made safer for women, 
and state governments took measures such as increasing police patrols in residential areas and installing CCTV cameras on most major streets and inside public places like malls and commercial complexes. The irony of heightened surveillance, which constrains public behavior even more acutely, is hopefully not lost on the young women who demand public safety, even as they want to be free to express themselves. After a certain time at night, public space in India is largely populated by men, and women who are seen on the streets at night are usually there for work, if they're sex workers, night shift workers, whatever. There is a good deal of harassment in public spaces of women, hijras, gotis, and trans men, and clearly this needs addressing by urban planners. But in the imagining of public space lurks the idea of private space, to which everyone is expected to have access. For some women, like sex workers or the homeless, the option of thinking of a private space as distinct from the public space does not even exist. And consequently, neither does a slotting of safety as a quality of one or the other space. And for women in urban slums, the lines between inside and outside, public and private, are constantly blurred, since much of the everyday life of the slum is conducted in the open. So while the question of access to public space is not in itself irrelevant, the way in which it has been framed largely addresses the middle or upper class woman in metropolitan centers. What happens to those in the globalizing city for whom public space is all the space there is? Mm. We found in our interviews that the idea of public safety was important for many young women in Bangalore and the seat is worth fighting for. But when asked whether private spaces are then necessarily the safer option, we got a range of mixed responses. For Gauri, who has experienced violence within the household, the outside world was more liberating. And she argued that at least she could face the outside world on her own. For inside the house, she did not know how much support she had and how much they believed what she was saying. Both streets and houses were unsafe, she argued based on her work as an activist. Violence that is visible can become a matter of public concern more easily than violence that remains behind doors. And while uh, feminist scholarship in India has long been talking about this, and feminist legal scholarship in particular, is not really part of uh, public discourse or common sense, uh, and needs to be repeated. So violence that remains behind doors, where women have to contend with the reluctance of the courts and the police to interfere in family matters, is very much present. Talking to women in the globalizing city made us realize that the problematizing of the private sphere of home, family, and domestic life that was taken up by feminists in India in the 70s and 80s is actually now part of urban common sense. Everyone does see that as you know, problematic. With the decrease in the number of middle class women in the workforce and the increasing number of women in certain sectors that the globalization of the economy has opened up, we don't have any hard numbers for this, but this is a speculation based on what we have found. Uh, there's a heightened level of intensity and fear surrounding the idea of violence against women in public space. It's here that we try to complicate perceptions of safety and violence as assigned to public and private space, so that we can help shift the discussions from the sole focus on violence, its perpetrators and victims, to the conditions of neoliberal globalization that render such violence inevitable. Under such conditions, what might it mean to speak about the reorganization of desire? Buzzwords such as connectivity, lifestyle, and mobility dot the idea map of the discourse of globalization, invoking notions of freedom, progress, and agency. We have tried to pay attention to how these terms circulate and what they signify for the young women to whom we talked. We tried to elicit stories that did not in any obvious way exemplify these notions, but instead suggest other routes by which to understand the globalizing urbanity of Bangalore. Through these stories, we will perhaps learn to look differently at what the city promises. Not specific lifestyles and specific choices, but instead the opening up of a number of possibilities, such as developing the potential to deal with one's gendering differently, or a critical reflex cultivated through the ability to compare the city with spaces left behind. So in our interviews, you will find these minor narratives. Minor not in the sense of unimportant or abject, but disruptive in different ways of the narratives of globality. These disruptions, we'd like to suggest, contain the potential of helping us rethink the very concepts, for example, private and public, that frame the existing approaches to urban space and how women occupy that space. <laughs>